Story fifteen of Christmas Stories by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story fifteen Somebody's Luggage. Part one. Chapter one His Leaving It Till Called For. The writer of these humble lines, being a waiter, and having come of a family of waiters, and owning at the present time five brothers who are all waiters, and likewise an only sister who is a waitress, would wish to offer a few words respecting his calling, first having the pleasure of hereby, in a friendly manner, offering the dedication of the same unto Joseph, much respected head-waiter at the Slam Jam Coffee House, London, E.C., than which an individual more eminently deserving of the name of man, or a more amenable honour to his own head and heart, whether considered in the light of a waiter or regarded as a human being, do not exist. In case confusion should arise in the public mind, which it is open to confusion on many subjects, respecting what is meant or implied by the term waiter, the present humble lines would wish to offer an explanation it may not be generally known that the person as goes out to wait is not a waiter it may not be generally known that the hand as is called in extra at the freemason's tavern or the london or the albion or otherwise is not a waiter such hands may be took on for public dinners by the bushel and you may know them by their breathing with difficulty when in attendance and taking away the bottle ere yet it is half out but such are not waiters, for you cannot lay down the tailoring, or the shoemaking, or the brokering, or the greengrocering, or the pictorial periodicaling, or the second-hand wardrobe, or the small fancy businesses. You cannot lay down those lines of life at your will and pleasure by the half-day or evening, and take up waitering. You may suppose you can, but you cannot or you may go so far as to say you do but you do not nor yet can you lay down the gentleman's service when stimulated by prolonged incompatibility on the part of cooks and here it may be remarked that cooking and incompatibility will be mostly found united and take up waitering it has been ascertained that what a gentleman will sit meek under at home he will not bear out of doors at the slam jam or any similar establishment then what is the inference to be drawn respecting true waitering you must be bred to it you must be born to it would you know how born to it fair reader if of the adorable female sex then learn from the biographical experience of one that is a waiter in the sixty-first year of his age you were conveyed ere yet your dawning powers were otherwise developed than to harbour vacancy in your inside you were conveyed by surreptitious means into a pantry adjoining the admiral nelson civic and general dining-rooms there to receive by stealth that healthful sustenance which is the pride and boast of the british female constitution your mother was married to your father himself a distant waiter in the profoundest secrecy for a waitress known to be married would ruin the best of businesses it is the same as on the stage hence your being smuggled into the pantry and that to add to the infliction by an unwilling grandmother under the combined influence of the smells of roast and boiled and soup and gas and malt liquors you partook of your earliest nourishment your unwilling grandmother sitting prepared to catch you when your mother was called and dropped you your grandmother's shawl ever ready to stifle your natural complainings your innocent mind surrounded by uncongenial cruets dirty plates dish covers and cold gravy your mother calling down the pipe for veals and porks instead of soothing you with nursery rhymes under these untoward circumstances you were early weaned your unwilling grandmother ever growing more unwilling as your food assimilated less then contracted habits of shaking you till your system curdled and your food would not assimilate at all at length she was no longer spared and could have been thankfully spared much sooner 
when your brothers began to appear in succession your mother retired left off her smart dressing she had previously been a smart dresser and her dark ringlets which had previously been flowing and haunted your father late of nights lying in wait for him through all weathers up the shabby court which led to the back door of the royal old dustbin said to have been so named by george the fourth where your father was head but the dustbin was going down then and your father took but little excepting from a liquid point of view your mother's object in these visits was of a housekeeping character and you was set on to whistle your father out sometimes he came out but generally not come or not come however all that part of his existence which was unconnected with open waitering was kept a close secret and was acknowledged by your mother to be a close secret and you and your mother flittered about the court close secrets both of you and would scarcely have confessed under torture that you knew your father or that your father had any name than dick which wasn't his name though he was never known by any other or that he had kith or kin or chick or child perhaps the attraction of this mystery combined with your father's having a damp compartment to himself behind a leaky cistern at the dustbin a sort of a cellar compartment with a sink in it and a smell and a plate rack and a bottle rack and three windows that didn't match each other or anything else and no daylight caused your young mind to feel convinced that you must grow up to be a waiter too but you did feel convinced of it and so did all your brothers down to your sister every one of you felt convinced that you was born to the waitering at this stage of your career what was your feelings one day when your father came home to your mother in open broad daylight of itself an act of madness on the part of a waiter and took to his bed leastways your mother and family's bed with the statement that his eyes were deviled kidneys physicians being in vain your father expired after repeating at intervals for a day and a night when gleams of reason and old business fitfully illuminated his being two and two is five and three is sixpence interred in the parochial department of the neighboring churchyard and accompanied to the grave by as many waiters of long standing as could spare the morning time from their soiled glasses namely one your bereaved form was attired in a white neckinger and you was took on from motives of benevolence at the george and gridiron theatrical and supper here supporting nature on what you found in the plates which was as it happened and but too often thoughtlessly immersed in mustard and on what you found in the glasses which rarely went beyond driblets and lemon by night you dropped asleep standing till you was cuffed awake and by day was set to polishing every individual article in the coffee-room your couch being sawdust your counterpane being ashes of cigars here frequently hiding a heavy heart under the smart tie of your white neckinger or correctly speaking lower down and more to the left you picked up the rudiments of knowledge from an extra by the name of bishops and by calling plate washer and gradually elevating your mind with chalk on the back of the corner box partition until such time as you used the inkstand when it was out of hand attained to manhood and to be the waiter that you find yourself i could wish here to offer a few respectful words on behalf of the calling so long the calling of myself and family and the public interest in which is but too often very limited you are not generally understood no we are not allowance enough is not made for us for say that we ever show a little drooping listlessness of spirits or what might be termed indifference or apathy put it to yourself what would your own state of mind be if you was one of an enormous family every member of which except you was always greedy and in a hurry put it to yourself that you was generally replete with animal food at the slack hours of one in the day and again at nine p m and that the repleter you was the more voracious all your fellow-creatures came in 
Put it to yourself that it was your business, when your digestion was well on, to take a personal interest and sympathy in a hundred gentlemen, fresh and fresh, say for the sake of argument only a hundred, whose imaginations was given up to grease and fat and gravy and melted butter, and abandoned to questioning you about cuts of this and dishes of that each of em going on as if him and you and the bill of fare was alone in the world then look what you are expected to know you are never out but they seem to think you regularly attend everywhere what's this christopher that i hear about the smashed excursion train how are they doing at the italian opera christopher christopher what are the real particulars of this business at the yorkshire bank similarly a ministry gives me more trouble than it gives the queen as to lord palmerston the constant and wearing connection into which i have been brought with his lordship during the last few years is deserving of a pension then look at the hypocrites we are made and the lies white i hope that are forced upon us why must a sedentary pursuited waiter be considered to be a judge of horseflesh and to have a most tremendous interest in horse training and racing yet it would be half of our little incomes out of our pockets if we didn't take on to have these sporting tastes it is the same inconceivable why with farming shooting equally so i am sure that no regular as the months of august september and october come around i am ashamed of myself in my own private bosom for the way in which i make believe to care whether or not the grouse is strong on the wing much their wings or drumsticks either signifies to me uncooked and whether the partridge is, is plentiful among the turnips and whether the pheasants is shy or bold or anything else you wish to mention yet you may see me or any other waiter of my standing holding on by the back of the box and leaning over a gentleman with his purse out and his bill before him discussing these points in a confidential tone of voice as if my happiness in life entirely depended on em i have mentioned our little incomes look at the most unreasonable point of all and the point on which the greatest injustice is done us whether it is owing to our always carrying so much change in our right-hand trouser pocket and so many halfpence in our coat-tails or whether it is human nature which i were loath to believe what is meant by the everlasting fable that head-waiters is rich how did that fable get into circulation who first put it about and what are the facts to establish the unblushing statement come forth thou slanderer and refer the public to the waiter's will in doctor's common supporting thy malignant hiss yet this is so commonly dwelt upon especially by the screws who give waiters the least that denial is vain and we are obliged for our credit's sake to carry our heads as if we were going into a business when of the two we are much more likely to go into a union there was formerly a screw as frequented the slam-jam ere yet the present writer had quitted that establishment on a question of teeing his assistant staff out of his own pocket which screw carried the taunt to its bitterest height never soaring above threepence and as often as not grovelling on the earth a penny lower he yet represented the present writer as a large holder of consoles a lender of money on mortgages a capitalist he has been overheard to dilate to other customers on the allegation that the present writer put out thousands of pounds at interest in distilleries and breweries well christopher he would say having grovelled his lowest on the earth half a moment before looking out for a house to open eh huh? can't find a business to be disposed of on a scale as is up to your resources hm? to such a dizzy precipice of falsehood has this misrepresentation taken wing that the well-known and highly respected old charles long eminent at the west country hotel and by some considered the father of the waitering found himself under the obligation to fall into it through so many years that his own wife for he had an unbeknown old lady in that capacity towards himself believed it and what was the consequence 
when he was borne to his grave on the shoulders of six picked waiters with six more for change six more acting as pallbearers all keeping step in a pouring shower without a dry eye visible and a concourse only inferior to royalty his pantry and lodgings were equally ransacked high and low for property and none was found how could it be found when beyond his last monthly collection of walking-sticks umbrellas and pocket-handkerchiefs which happened to have been not yet disposed of though he had ever been through life punctual in clearing off his collections by the month there was no property existing such however is the force of this universal libel that the widow of old charles at the present hour an inmate of the almshouses of the cork cutters company in blue anchor road identified sitting at the door of one of em in a clean cap and a windsor armchair only last monday expects john's hoarded wealth to be found hourly nay ere yet he had succumbed to the grisly dart and when his portrait was painted in oils life-size by subscription of the frequenters of the west country to hang over the coffee-room chimney-piece there were not wanting those who contended that what is termed the accessories of such a portrait ought to be the bank of england out of window and a strong-box on the table and but for better regulated minds contending for a bottle and screw and the attitude of drawing and carrying their point it would have been so handed down to posterity i am now brought to the title of the present remarks having i hope without offence to any quarter offered such observations as i felt it my duty to offer in a free country which has ever dominated the seas on the general subject i will now proceed to wait on the particular question at a momentous period of my life when i was off so far as concerned notice given with a house that shall be nameless for the question on which i took my departing stand was a fixed charge for waiters and no house as commits itself to that eminently un-english act of more than foolishness and baseness shall be advertised by me i repeat at a momentous crisis when i was off with a house too mean for mention and not yet on with that to which i have ever since had the honour of being attached in the capacity of head i was casting about what to do next then it were that proposals were made to me on behalf of my present establishment stipulations were necessary on my part emendations were necessary on my part in the end ratifications ensued on both sides and i entered on a new career we are a bed business and a coffee-room business we are not a general dining business nor do we wish it in consequence when diners drop in we know what to give em as will keep em away another time we are a private room or family business also but coffee room principal me and the directory and the writing material and cetrer occupy a place to ourselves a place fended off up a step or two at the end of the coffee room in what i call the good old-fashioned style the good old-fashioned style is that whatever you want down to a wafer you must be wholly and solely dependent on the head waiter for you must put yourself a new-born child into his hands there is no other way in which a business untinged with continental vice can be conducted it were bootless to add that if languages is required to be jabbered and english is not good enough both families and gentlemen had better go somewhere else when i began to settle down on this right principled and well-conducted house i noticed under the bed in number twenty four b which it is up a angle off the staircase and usually put off on the lowly-minded a heap of things in a corner i asked our head chambermaid in the course of the day what are them things in twenty four b to which she answered with a careless air somebody's luggage regarding her with a eye not free from severity i says whose luggage evading my eye she replied lor how should i know being it may be right to mention a female of some pertness though acquainted with her business a head waiter must be either head or tail 
he must be at one extremity or the other of the social scale he cannot be at the waist of it or anywhere else but the extremities it is for him to decide which of the extremities on the eventful occasion under consideration i give mrs pratchett so distinctly to understand my decision that i broke her spirit as towards myself then and there and for good let not inconsistency be suspected on account of my mentioning mrs pratchett as mrs and having formerly remarked that a waitress must not be married readers are respectfully requested to notice that mrs pratchett is not a waitress but a chambermaid now a chambermaid may be married if head generally is married or says so it comes to the same thing as expressing what is customary n b mr pratchett is in australia and his address there is the bush having took mrs pratchett down as many pegs as was essential to the future happiness of all parties i requested her to explain herself for instance i says to give her a little encouragement who is somebody i give you my sacred honour mr christopher answered pratchett that i haven't the faintest notion but for the manner in which she settled her cap-strings i should have doubted this but in respect of positiveness it was hardly to be discriminated from an affidavit then you never saw him i followed her up with nor yet said mrs pratchett shutting her eyes and making as if she had just took a pill of unusual circumference which gave a remarkable force to her denial nor yet any servant in this house all have been changed mr christopher within five year and somebody left his luggage here before then inquiry of miss martin yielded in the language of the bard of a one confirmation strong so it had really and truly happened miss martin is the young lady at the bar as makes out our bills and though higher than i could wish considering her station is perfectly well behaved farther investigation led to the disclosure that there was a bill against this luggage to the amount of two sixteen six the luggage had been lying under the bedstead of twenty four b over six year the bedstead is a four-poster with a deal of old hanging and valence and is as i once said probably connected with more than twenty four b's which i remember my hearer was pleased to laugh at at the time i don't know why when do we know why but this luggage laid heavy on my mind i fell a wondering about somebody and what he had got and been up to i couldn't satisfy my thoughts why he should leave so much luggage against so small a bill for i had the luggage out within a day or two and turned it over and the following were the items a black portmanteau a black bag a desk a dressing-case a brown paper parcel a hat-box and an umbrella strapped to a walking-stick it was all very dusty and fluey i had our porter up to get under the bed and fetch it out and though he habitually wallows in dust swims in it from morning to night and wears a close-fitting waistcoat with black calamanco sleeves for the purpose it made him sneeze again and his throat was that hot with it that it was obliged to be cooled with a drink of alsopi's draught the luggage so got the better of me that instead of having it put back when it was well dusted and washed with a wet cloth previous to which it was so covered with feathers that you might have thought it was turning into poultry and would by and by begin to lay i say instead of having it put back i had it carried into one of my places downstairs there from time to time i stared at it and stared at it until it seemed to grow big and grow little and came forward at me and retreat again and go through all manner of performances resembling intoxication when this had lasted weeks i may say months and not be far out i one day thought of asking miss martin for the particulars of the two sixteen six total she was so obliging as to extract it from the books it dating before her time and here follows a true copy readers note here follows an extensive list of charges End note memorandum july first eighteen fifty seven he went out after dinner directing luggage to be ready when he called for it never called 
so far from throwing a light upon the subject this bill appeared to me if i may so express my doubts to involve it in a yet more lurid halo speculating it over with the mistress she informed me that the luggage had been advertised in the master's time as being to be sold after such and such a day to pay expenses but no farther steps had been taken i may here remark that the mistress is a widow in her fourth year the master was possessed of one of those unfortunate constitutions in which spirits turns to water and rises in the ill-starred victim my speculating it over not then only but repeatedly sometimes with the mistress sometimes with one sometimes with another led up to the mistress's saying to me whether at first in joke or in earnest or half joke and half earnest it matters not christopher i am going to make you a handsome offer if this should meet her eye a lovely blue may she not take it ill my mentioning that if i had been eight or ten year younger i would have done as much by her that is i would have made her a offer it is for others than me to denominate it a handsome one christopher i am going to make you a handsome offer put a name to it ma'am look here christopher run over the articles of somebody's luggage you've got it all by heart i know a black portmanteau ma'am a black bag a desk a dressing-case a brown paper parcel a hat-box and an umbrella strapped to a walking-stick all just as they were left nothing opened nothing tampered with you are right ma'am all locked but the brown paper parcel and that sealed the mistress was leaning on miss martin's desk at the bar window and she taps the open book that lays upon the desk she has a pretty made hand to be sure and bobs her head over it and laughs come says she christopher pay me somebody's bill and you shall have somebody's luggage i rather took to the idea from the first moment but it mayn't be worth the money i objected seeming to hold back that's a lottery says the mistress folding her arms upon the book it ain't her hands alone that's pretty made the observation extends right up her arms won't you venture two pounds sixteen shillings and sixpence in the lottery why there's no blanks says the mistress laughing and bobbing her head again you must win if you lose you must win all prizes in this lottery draw a blank and remember gentlemen sportsmen you'll still be entitled to a black portmanteau a black bag a desk a dressing-case a sheet of brown paper a hat-box and an umbrella strapped to a walking-stick to make short of it miss martin come round me and mrs pratchett come round me and the mistress she was completely round me already and all the women in the house come round me and if it had been sixteen two instead of two sixteen i should have thought myself well out of it for what can you do when they do come round you so i paid the money down and such a laughing as there was among them but i turned the tables on em regularly when i said my family name is bluebeard i'm going to open somebody's luggage all alone in the secret chamber and not a female eye catches sight of the contents whether i thought proper to have the firmness to keep to this don't signify or whether any female eye and if any how many was really present when the opening of the luggage came off somebody's luggage is the question at present nobody's eyes nor yet noses what i still look at most in connection with that luggage is the extraordinary quantity of writing paper and all written on and not our paper neither not the paper charged in the bill for we know our paper so he must have been always at it and he had crumpled up this writing of his everywhere in every part and parcel of his luggage there was writing in his dressing-case writing in his boots writing among his shaving tackle writing in his hat-box writing folded away down among the very whalebones of his umbrella his clothes wasn't bad what there was of em his dressing-case was poor not a particle of silver stopper bottle apertures with nothing in em like empty little dog kennels and a most searching description of tooth-powder diffusing itself around as under a deluded mistake that all the chinks in the fittings was divisions in teeth 
His clothes I parted with well enough to a second-hand dealer, not far from St. Clement Danes, in the Strand. Him, as the officers in the army mostly dispose of their uniforms to, when hard-pressed with debts of honour, if I may judge from their coats and epaulets, diversifying the window with their backs towards the public. The same party bought in one lot the portmanteau, the bag, the desk, the dressing-case, the hat-box, the umbrella, strap, and walking-stick. On my remarking that I should have thought those articles not quite in his line, he said, No more ith a man'th grandmother, Mr. Christopher, but if any man will bring hith grandmother here, and offer her at a fair trifle, below what theel feth with good luck, when thee'th uncurred and turned, I'll buy her these transactions brought me home and indeed more than home for they left a goodish profit on the original investment and now there remained the writings and the writings i particularly wish to bring under the candid attention of the reader i wish to do so without postponement for this reason this is to say namely viz i e as follows thus before i proceed to recount the mental sufferings of which i became the prey in consequence of the writings and before following up that harrowing tale with a statement of the wonderful and impressive catastrophe as thrilling in its nature as unlooked for in any other capacity which crowned the old and filled the cup of unexpectedness to overflowing the writings themselves ought to stand forth to view therefore it is that they now come next one word to introduce them and i lay down my pen i hope my unassuming pen until i take it up to trace the gloomy sequel of a mind with something on it he was a smeary writer and wrote a dreadful bad hand utterly regardless of ink he lavished it on every undeserving object on his clothes his desk his hat the handle of his toothbrush his umbrella ink was found freely on the coffee-room carpet by number four table and two blots was on his restless couch a reference to the document i have given entire will show that on the morning of the third of february eighteen fifty six he procured his no less than fifth pen and paper to whatever deplorable act of ungovernable composition he immolated those materials obtained from the bar there is no doubt that the fatal deed was committed in bed and that it left its evidences but too plainly long afterwards upon the pillow-case he had put no heading to any of his writings alas was he likely to have a heading without a head and where was his head when he took such things into it in some cases such as his boots he would appear to have hid the writings thereby involving his style in greater obscurity but his boots was at least pairs and no two of his writings can put in any claim to be so regarded here follows not to give more specimens what was found in chapter two his boots ah well then monsieur Mutiel, what do i know what can i say i assure you that he calls himself monsieur the englishman pardon but i think it is impossible said monsieur mutuel a spectacled snuffy stooping old gentleman in carpet shoes and a cloth cap with a peaked shade a loose blue frock coat reaching to his heels a large limp white shirt frill and cravat to correspond that is to say white was the natural colour of his linen on sundays but it toned down with the week it is repeated monsieur mutuel his amiable old walnut-shell countenance very walnut-shelly indeed as he smiled and blinked in the bright morning sunlight it is my cherished madame bouclet i think impossible eh with a little vexed cry and a great many tosses of her head but it is not impossible that you are a pig retorted madame bouclet a compact little woman of thirty-five or so see then look there read on the second floor monsieur l'anglais is it not so it is so said monsieur mutuel good continue your morning walk get out madame bouclet dismissed him with a lively snap of her fingers 
The morning walk of Monsieur Mutuel was in the brightest patch that the sun made in the Grand Place of a dull old fortified French town. The manner of his morning walk was with his hands crossed behind him, an umbrella, in figure the express image of himself, always in one hand, a snuff-box in the other. Thus, with the shuffling gait of the elephant, who really does deal with the very worst trouser-maker employed by the zoological world, and who appears to have recommended him to Monsieur Mutuel, the old gentleman sunned himself daily when some was to be had, of course at the same time sunning a red ribbon in his buttonhole, for was he not an ancient Frenchman? Being told by one of the angelic sex to continue his morning walk and get out, Monsieur Mutuel laughed a walnut-shell laugh, pulled off his cap at arm's length with the hand that contained his snuff-box, kept it off for a considerable period after he had parted from Madame Bouclet, and continued his morning walk and got out like a man of gallantry as he was. The documentary evidence to which Madame Bouclet had referred M. Mutuel was the list of her lodgers, sweetly written forth by her own nephew and bookkeeper, who held the pen of an angel, and closed up at the side of her gateway for the information of the police. Au second, M. Langlais, propriétaire. On the second floor, M. the Englishman, man of property. So it stood. Nothing could be plainer. Madame Bouclet now traced the line with her forefinger, as it were, to confirm and settle herself in her parting snap at Monsieur Mutuel, and so, placing her right hand on her hip with a defiant air, as if nothing should ever tempt her to unsnap that snap, strolled out into the place to glance up at the windows of Monsieur the Englishman. That worthy, happening to be looking out the window at the moment, Madame Bouclet gave him a graceful salutation with her head, looked to the right and looked to the left to account to him for her being there, considered for a moment, like one who accounted to herself for somebody she had expected not being there, and re-entered her own entryway. Madame Bouclet let all her house giving on the place in furnished flats or floors, and lived up the yard behind in company with Monsieur Bouclet, her husband, great at billiards, an inherited brewing business, several fowls, two carts, a nephew, a little dog in a big kennel, a grapevine, a counting-house, four horses, a married sister, with a share in the brewing business, the husband and two children of the married sister, a parrot, a drum, performed on by the little boy of the married sister, two billeted soldiers, a quantity of pigeons, a fife, played by the nephew in a ravishing manner, several domestics and supernumeraries, a perpetual flavor of coffee and soup, a terrific range of artificial rocks and wooden precipices, at least four feet high, a small fountain, and half a dozen large sunflowers. Now the Englishman, in taking his appartement, or, as one might say on our side of the channel, his set of chambers, had given his name, correct to the letter, Longley. But as he had had a British way of not opening his mouth very wide on foreign soil, except at meals, the brewery had been able to make nothing of it but Longley. So Mr. the Englishman he had become, and he remained. "'Never saw such a people,' muttered Mr. the Englishman, as he now looked out of the window. "'Never did in my life.' This was true enough, for he had never before been out of his own country, a right little island, a tight little island, a bright little island, a show-fight little island, and full of merit of all sorts, but not the whole round world. These chaps, said Mr. the Englishman to himself, as his eye rolled over the place, sprinkled with military here and there, are no more like soldiers nothing being sufficiently strong for the end of his sentence he left it unended this again from the point of view of his experience was strictly correct for though there was a great agglomeration of soldiers in the town and neighbouring country you might have held a grand review and field day of them every one and looked in vain among them all for a soldier choking behind his foolish stock or a soldier lamed by his ill-fitting shoes 
or a soldier deprived of the use of his limbs by straps and buttons or a soldier elaborately forced to be self-helpless in all the small affairs of life a swarm of brisk bright active bustling handy odd skirmishing fellows able to turn cleverly at anything from a siege to soup from great guns to needles and thread from the broadsword exercise to slicing an onion from making war to making omelettes was all you would have found what a swarm from the great place under the eye of mr the englishman where a few awkward squads from the last conscription were doing the goose step some members of those squads still as to their bodies in the chrysalis peasant state of blues and only military butterflies as to their regimentally clothed legs from the great loss away outside the fortifications and away for miles along the dusty roads soldiers swarmed all day long upon the grass-grown ramparts of the town practicing soldiers trumpeted and bugled all day long down in angles of dry trenches practicing soldiers drummed and drummed every forenoon soldiers burst out of the great barracks into the sandy gymnasium ground hard by and flew over the wooden horse and hung on to flying ropes and dangled upside down between parallel bars and shot themselves off wooden platforms splashes sparks coruscations showers of soldiers at every corner of the town hall every guard-house every gateway every sentry-box every drawbridge every reedy ditch and rushy dyke soldiers 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 and the town being pretty well all wall guard-house gateway sentry-box drawbridge reedy ditch and rushy dyke the town was pretty well all soldiers what would the sleepy old town have been without the soldiers seeing that even with them it had so overslept itself as to have slept its echoes hoarse its defensive bars and locks and bolts and chains all rusty and its ditches stagnant from the days when vauban engineered it to that perplexing extent that to look at it was like being knocked on the head with it the stranger becoming stunned and stertorous under the shock of its incomprehensibility from the days when vauban made it the express incorporation of every substantive and adjective in the art of military engineering and not only twisted you into it and twisted you out of it to the right to the left opposite under here over there in the dark in the dirt by the gateway archway covered way dry way wet way foss portcullis drawbridge sluice squat tower pierce wall and heavy battery but likewise took a fortifying dive under the neighboring country and came to the surface three or four miles off blowing out incomprehensible mounds and batteries among the quiet crops of chicory and beetroot from those days to these the town had been asleep and dust and rust and must had settled on its drowsy arsenals and magazines and grass had grown up in its silent streets end of story fifteen part one Story fifteen of Christmas Stories by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story fifteen Somebody's Luggage Part two. On market days alone, its great place suddenly leaped out of bed. On market days, some friendly enchanter struck his staff upon the stones of the great place, and instantly arose the liveliest booths and stalls and sittings and standings, and a pleasant hum of chaffering and huckstering from many hundreds of tongues, and a pleasant, though peculiar, blending of colors—white caps, blue blouses, and green vegetables and at last the night destined for the adventure seemed to have come in earnest and all the vaubanois sprang up awake and now by long low-lying avenues of trees jolting in white-hooded donkey-cart and on donkey-back and in tumbrel and wagon and cart and cabriolet and afoot with barrow and burden and along the dikes and ditches and canals and little peak-proud country boats came peasant men and women in flocks and crowds 
bringing articles for sale and here you had boots and shoes and sweetmeats and stuff to wear and here in the cool shade of the town hall you had milk and cream and butter and cheese and here you had fruits and onions and carrots and all things needful for your soup and here you had poultry and flowers and protesting pigs and here new shovels axes spades and bill-hooks for your farming work and here huge mounds of bread and here your unground grain in and sacks and here your children's dolls and here the cake seller announcing his wares by beat and roll of drum and hark fanfaronade of trumpets and here into the great place resplendent in an open carriage with four gorgeously attired servitors up behind playing horns drums and cymbals rolled the daughter of a physician in massive golden chains and car rings and blue feathered hat shaded from the admiring sun by two immense umbrellas of artificial roses to dispense from motives of philanthropy that small and pleasant dose which had cured so many thousands toothache earache headache heartache stomachache debility nervousness fits fainting fever ague all equally cured by the small and pleasant dose of the great physician's great daughter the process was this she the daughter of a physician proprietress of the superb equipage you now admired with its confirmatory blasts of trumpet drum and cymbal told you so on the first day after taking the small and pleasant dose you would feel no particular influence beyond a most harmonious sensation of indescribable and irresistible joy on the second day you would be so astonishingly better that you would think yourself changed into somebody else on the third day you would be entirely free from your disorder whatever its nature and however long you had had it and would seek out the physician's daughter to throw yourself at her feet kiss the hem of her garment and buy as many more of the small and pleasant doses as by the sale of all your few effects you could obtain but she would be inaccessible gone for herbs to the pyramids of egypt and you would be though cured reduced to despair thus would the physician's daughter drive her trade and briskly too and thus would the buying and selling and mingling of tongues and colours continue until the changing sunlight leaving the physician's daughter in the shadow of high roofs admonished her to jolt out westward with a departing effect of gleam and glitter on the splendid equipage and brazen blast and now the enchanter struck his staff upon the stones of the great place once more and down went the booths the sittings and standings and vanished the merchandise and with it the barrows donkeys donkey carts and tumbrels and all other things on wheels and feet except the slow scavengers with unwieldy carts and meagre horses clearing up the rubbish assisted by the sleek town pigeons better plumped out than on non-market days while there was yet an hour or two to wane before the autumn sunset the loiterer outside town gate and drawbridge and postern and double hitch would see the last white hooded cart lessening in the avenue of lengthening shadows of trees or the last country boat paddled by the last market woman on her way home showing black upon the reddening long low narrow dyke between him and the mill and as the paddle parted scum and weed closed over the boat's track he might be comfortably sure that its sluggish rest would be troubled no more until next market day as it was not one of the great place's days for getting out of bed when mr the englishman looked down at the young soldiers practising the goose-step there his mind was left at liberty to take a military turn these fellows are billeted everywhere about said he and to see them lighting the people's fires boiling the people's pots minding the people's babies rocking the people's cradles washing the people's greens and making themselves generally useful in every sort of unmilitary way is most ridiculous never saw such a set of fellows never did in my life all perfectly true again 
Was there not Private Valentine in that very house, acting as sole housemaid, valet, cook, steward, and nurse, in the family of his captain, Monsieur le Capitaine de la Cour, cleaning the floors, making the beds, doing the marketing, dressing the captain, dressing the dinners, dressing the salads, and dressing the baby, all with equal readiness? or to put him aside he being in loyal attendance on his chief was there not private hippolyte billeted at the perfumer's two hundred yards off who when not on duty volunteered to keep shop while the fair perfumeress stepped out to speak to a neighbour or so and laughingly sold soap with his war-sword girded on him was there not emile billeted at the clockmaker's perpetually turning to of an evening with his coat off winding up the stock was there not eugene billeted at the tinman's cultivating pipe in mouth a garden four feet square for the tinman in the little court behind the shop and extorting the fruits of the earth from the same on his knees with the sweat of his brow not to multiply examples was there not baptiste billeted on the poor water-carrier at that very instant sitting on the pavement in the sunlight with his martial legs asunder and one of the water-carrier's spare pails between them which to the delight and glory of the heart of the water-carrier coming across the place from the fountain yoked and burdened he was painting bright green outside and bright red within or to go no farther than the barber's at the very next door was there not corporal theophile no said mr the englishman glancing down at the barber's he is not there at present there's the child though a mere mite of a girl stood on the steps of the barber's shop looking across the place a mere baby one might call her dressed in the close white linen cap which small french country children wear like the children in dutch pictures and in a frock of homespun blue that had no shape except where it was tied round her little fat throat so that being naturally short and round all over she looked behind as if she had been cut off at her natural waist and had had her head neatly fitted on it there's the child though to judge from the way in which the dimpled hand was rubbing the eyes the eyes had been closed in a nap and were newly opened but they seemed to be looking so intently across the place that the englishman looked in the same direction oh said he presently i thought as much the corporal's there the corporal a smart figure of a man of thirty perhaps a thought under the middle size but very neatly made a sunburnt corporal with a brown peaked beard faced about at the moment addressing voluble words of instruction to the squad in hand nothing was amiss or awry about the corporal a lithe and nimble corporal quite complete from the sparkling dark eyes under his knowing uniform cap to his sparkling white gaiters the very image and presentment of a corporal of his country's army in the line of his shoulders the line of his waist the broadest line of his bloomer trousers and their narrowest line at the calf of his leg mr the englishman looked on and the child looked on and the corporal looked on but the last named at his men until the drill ended a few minutes afterwards and the military sprinkling dried up directly and was gone then said mr the englishman to himself look here by george and the corporal dancing towards the barbers with his arms wide open caught up the child held her over his head in a flying attitude caught her down again kissed her and made off with her into the barber's house now mr the englishman had had a quarrel with his erring and disobedient and disowned daughter and there was a child in that case too had not his daughter been a child and had she not taken angel flights above his head as this child had flown above the corporal's he's a national participled fool said the englishman and shut his window but the windows of the house of memory and the windows of the house of mercy are not so easily closed as windows of glass and wood they fly open unexpectedly they rattle in the night they must be nailed up 
Mr. The Englishman had tried nailing them, but had not driven the nails quite home. So he passed but a disturbed evening and a worse night. By nature a good-tempered man? No. Very little gentleness, confounding the quality with weakness. Fierce and wrathful when crossed? Very, and stupendously unreasonable. Moody? Exceedingly so. Vindictive? Well, he had had scowling thoughts that he would formally curse his daughter, as he had seen it done on the stage, but remembering that the real heaven is some paces removed from the mock one in the great chandelier of the theatre, he had given that up. And he had come abroad to be rid of his repudiated daughter for the rest of his life. And here he was. At bottom it was for this reason, more than for any other, that Mr. the Englishman took it extremely ill that Corporal Théophile should be so devoted to little Babel, the child at the barber's shop. In an unlucky moment he had chanced to say to himself, "'Why, confound the fellow, he is not her father!' There was a sharp sting in the speech which ran into him suddenly and put him in a worse mood. So he had national participled the unconscious corporal with most hearty emphasis, and had made up his mind to think no more about such a mountebank. But it came to pass that the corporal was not to be dismissed. If he had known the most delicate fibres of the Englishman's mind, instead of knowing nothing on earth about him, and if he had been the most obstinate corporal in the Grand Army of France, instead of being the most obliging, he could not have planted himself with more determined immovability plump in the midst of all the Englishman's thoughts. Not only so, but he seemed to be always in his view. Mr. The Englishman had but to look out the window to look upon the corporal with little Babel. He had but to go for a walk, and there was the corporal walking with Babel. He had but to come home again, disgusted, and the corporal and Babel were at home before him. If he looked out at his back windows early in the morning, the corporal was in the barber's back yard, washing and dressing and brushing Babel. If he took refuge at his front windows, the corporal brought his breakfast out into the place and shared it there with Babel. Always corporal and always Babel. Never corporal without Babel. Never Babel without corporal. Mr. The Englishman was not particularly strong in the French language as a means of oral communication, though he read it very well. It is with languages as with people. When you only know them by sight, you are apt to mistake them. You must be on speaking terms before you can be said to have established an acquaintance. For this reason, Mr. The Englishman had to gird up his loins considerably before he could bring himself to the point of exchanging ideas with Madame Bouclet on the subject of this corporal and this Babel. But Madame Bouclet, looking in apologetically one morning, to remark that, oh, heaven, she was in a state of desolation, because the lamp-maker had not sent home that lamp confided to him to repair, but that truly he was a lamp-maker against whom the whole world shrieked out. Mr. The Englishman seized the occasion. Madame, that baby, pardon, monsieur, that lamp, no, no, that little girl, but pardon, said Madame Bouclet, angling for a clue, one cannot light a little girl or send her to be repaired. The little girl at the house of the barber. Ah, cried Madame Bouclet, suddenly catching the idea with her delicate little line and rod. Little Babel, yes, 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 and her friend the corporal. Yes, 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 yes. So genteel of him, is it not? He is not not at all not at all he is not one of her relations not at all why then he perfectly cried madame bouclet you are right monsieur it is so genteel of him the less relation the more genteel as you say is she the child of the barber madame bouclet whisked up her skilful little line and rod again not at all not at all she is the child of in a word of no one the wife of the barber, then? Indubitably, as you say, the wife of the barber receives a small stipend to take care of her. So much by the month. Ah, then, it is without doubt very little, for we are all poor here. You are not poor, madame. 
As to my lodgers,' replied Madame Bouclet, with a smiling and a gracious bend of her head, no. As to all things else, so-so. You flatter me, madame. Monsieur, it is you who flatter me in living here. Certain fishy gasps on Mr. the Englishman's part, denoting that he was about to resume his subject under difficulties, Madame Bouclet observed him closely and whisked up her delicate line and rod again, with triumphant success. Oh, no, monsieur, certainly not. The wife of the barber is not cruel to the poor child, but she is careless. Her health is delicate, and she sits all day looking out at window. Consequently, when the corporal first came, the poor little Babel was much neglected. "'It is a curious,' began Mr. the Englishman. "'Name? That Babel? Again, you are right, monsieur, but it is a playful name for Gabrielle.' "'And so the child is a mere fancy of the corporal's,' said Mr. the Englishman, in a gruffly disparaging tone of voice. "'Ah, well,' returned Madame Bouclet, with a pleading shrug, "'one must love something. Human nature is weak.' "'Devilish weak,' muttered the Englishman, in his own tongue. "'And the corporal,' pursued Madame Bouclet, "'being billeted at the barber's, where he will probably remain a long time, for he is attached to the general, and finding the poor unowned child in need of being loved, and finding himself in need of loving, why, there you have it all, you see. Mr. the Englishman accepted this interpretation of the matter with an indifferent grace, and observed to himself, in an injured manner, when he was again alone, I shouldn't mind it so much if these people were not such a national participled sentimental people. There was a cemetery outside the town, and it happened ill for the reputation of the Vaubanois in this sentimental connection that he took a walk there that same afternoon. To be sure, there were some wonderful things in it, from the Englishman's point of view, and of a certainty in all Britain you would have found nothing like it not to mention the fanciful flourishes of hearts and crosses in wood and iron that were planted all over the place making it look very like a firework ground where a most splendid pyrotechnic display might be expected after dark there were so many wreaths upon the graves embroidered as it might be to my mother to my daughter to my father to my brother to my sister to my friend and those many wreaths were in so many stages of elaboration and decay, from the wreath of yesterday, all fresh color and bright beads, to the wreath of last year, a poor mouldering wisp of straw. There were so many little gardens and grottoes made upon graves, in so many tastes, with plants and shells and plaster figures and porcelain pitchers, and so many odds and ends there were so many tributes of remembrance hanging up not to be discriminated by the closest inspection from little round waiters whereon were depicted in glowing hues either a lady or a gentleman with a white pocket-handkerchief out of all proportion leaning in a state of the most faultless mourning and most profound affliction on the most architectural and gorgeous urn there were so many surviving wives who had put their names on the tombs of their deceased husbands with a blank for the date of their own departure from this weary world and there were so many surviving husbands who had rendered the same homage to their deceased wives and out of the number there must have been so many who had long ago married again in fine there was so much in the place that would have seemed mere frippery to a stranger save for the consideration that the lightest paper flower that lay upon the poorest heap of earth was never touched by a rude hand but perished there a sacred thing nothing of the solemnity of death here mr the englishman had been going to say when this last consideration touched him with a mild appeal and on the whole he walked out without saying it but these people are he insisted by way of compensation when he was well outside the gate they are so participled sentimental his way back lay by the military gymnasium ground and there he passed the corporal glibly instructing young soldiers how to swing themselves over rapid and deep water courses on their way to glory by means of a rope and himself deftly plunging off a platform and flying a hundred feet or so 
as an encouragement to them to begin and there he also passed perched on a crowning eminence probably by the corporal's careful hands the small bebelle with her round eyes wide open surveying the proceeding like a wondering sort of blue and white bird if that child was to die this was his reflection as he turned his back and went his way and it would almost serve the fellow right for making such a fool of himself i suppose we should have him sticking up a wreath and a waiter in that fantastic burying ground nevertheless after another early morning or two of looking out of window and strolling down into the place when the corporal and bebelle were walking there and touching his hat to the corporal an immense achievement wished him a good day good day monsieur this is a rather pretty child you have here said mr the englishman taking her chin in his hand and looking down into her astonished blue eyes sure she is a very pretty child returned the corporal with a stress on his polite correction of the phrase and good said the englishman and very good poor little thing ah the englishman stooped down and patted her cheeks not without awkwardness as if he were going too far in his conciliation and what is this medal round your neck my little one bebelle having no other reply on her lips than her chubby right fist the corporal offered his services as interpreter monsieur demands what is this bebelle it is the holy virgin said bebelle and who gave it you asked the englishman Théophile. And who is Théophile? Babelle broke into a laugh, laughed merrily and heartily, clapped her chubby hands, and beat her little feet on the stone pavement of the place. He doesn't know Théophile. Why, he doesn't know anyone. He doesn't know anything. Then, sensible of a small solecism in her manners, Babelle twisted her right hand in a leg of the corporal's bloomer trousers, and, laying her cheek against the place, kissed it. Monsieur Théophile, I believe, said the Englishman to the corporal. It is I, monsieur. Permit me, Mr. The Englishman shook him heartily by the hand and turned away. Then he took it mightily ill that old Monsieur Mutuel, in his patch of sunlight, upon whom he came as he turned, should pull off his cap to him with a look of pleased approval. And he muttered in his own tongue as he returned the salutation, well walnut shell and what business is it of yours mr the englishman went on for many weeks passing but disturbed evenings and worse nights and constantly experiencing that those aforesaid windows in the houses of memory and mercy rattled after dark and that he had very imperfectly nailed them up likewise he went on for many weeks daily improving the acquaintance of the corporal and the bell that is to say, he took Bebel by the chin, and the corporal by the hand, and offered Bebel sous, and the corporal cigars, and even got the length of changing pipes with the corporal and kissing Bebel. But he did it all in a shamefaced way, and always took it extremely ill that Monsieur Mutuel, in his patch of sunlight, should note what he did. Whenever that seemed to be the case, he always growled in his own tongue, there you are again walnut shell what business is it of yours in a word it had become the occupation of mr the englishman's life to look after the corporal and the little bebelle and to resent old monsieur mutuel's looking after him an occupation only varied by a fire in the town one windy night and much passing of water buckets from hand to hand in which the englishman rendered good service and much beating of drums when all of a sudden the corporal disappeared next all of a sudden the bell disappeared she had been visible a few days later than the corporal sadly deteriorated as to washing and brushing but she had not spoken when addressed by mr the englishman and had looked scared and had run away and now it would seem that she had run away for good and there lay the great place under the windows bare and barren 
In his shamefaced and constrained way the Englishman asked no question of any one, but watched from his front windows, and watched from his back windows, and lingered about the Place, and peeped in at the barber shop, and did all this and much more with a whistling and tune-humming pretense of not missing anything, until one afternoon, when M. Michuel's patch of sunlight was in shadow, and when, according to all rule and precedent, he had no right what ever to bring his red ribbon out of doors behold here he was advancing with his cap already in his hand twelve paces off mr the englishman had got as far into his usual objurgation as what business when he checked himself ah it is sad it is sad alas it is unhappy it is sad thus old m michuel shaking his grey head what business at least i would say what do you mean monsieur mutuel our corporal hélas our dear corporal what has happened to him you have not heard no at the fire but he was brave so ready ah too brave too ready may the devil carry you away the englishman broke in impatiently i, I beg your pardon i mean me i i'm not accustomed to speak french uh, go on will you and a falling beam good god exclaimed the englishman it was a private soldier who was killed no a corporal the same corporal our dear corporal beloved by all his comrades the funeral ceremony was touching penetrating monsieur the englishman your eyes fill with tears what business monsieur the englishman i honour those emotions i salute you with profound respect i will not obtrude myself upon your noble heart monsieur mutuel a gentleman in every thread of his cloudy linen under whose wrinkled hand every grain in the quarter of an ounce of poor snuff in his poor little tin box became a gentleman's property monsieur mutuel passed on with his cap in his hand i little thought said the englishman after walking for several minutes and more than once blowing his nose when i was looking round that cemetery i'll go there straight he went there and when he came within the gate he paused considering whether he should ask at the lodge for some direction to the grave but he was less than ever in a mood for asking questions and he thought i shall see something on it to know it by in search of the corporal's grave he went softly on up this walk and down that peering in among the crosses and hearts and columns and obelisks and tombstones for a recently disturbed spot it troubled him now to think how many dead there were in the cemetery he had not thought them a tenth part so numerous before and after he had walked and sought for some time he said to himself as he struck down a new vista of tombs i might suppose that every one was dead but i not every one a live child was lying on the ground asleep truly he had found something on the corporal's grave to know it by and the something was bebel with such a loving will had the dead soldier's comrades worked at his resting place that it was already a neat garden on the green turf of the garden bebel lay sleeping with her cheek touching it a plain unpainted little wooden cross was planted in the turf and her short arm embraced this little cross as it had many a time embraced the corporal's neck they had put a tiny flag the flag of france at his head and a laurel garland mr the englishman took off his hat and stood for a while silent then covering his head again he bent down on one knee and softly roused the child babel my little one opening her eyes on which the tears were still wet babel was at first frightened but seeing who it was she suffered him to take her in his arms looking steadfastly at him you must not lie here my little one you must come with me no no i can't leave theophile i want the good dear theophile we will go and seek him babel we will go and look for him in england we will go and look for him at my daughter's babel shall we find him there we shall find the best part of him there come with me poor forlorn little one 
heaven is my witness said the englishman in a low voice as before he rose he touched the turf above the gentle corporal's breast that i thankfully accept this trust it was a long way for the child to have come unaided she was soon asleep again with her embrace transferred to the englishman's neck he looked at her worn shoes and her galled feet and her tired face and believed that she had come there every day he was leaving the grave with the slumbering babel in his arms when he stopped looked wistfully down at it and looked wistfully at the other graves around it is the innocent custom of the people said mr the englishman with hesitation i think i should like to do it no one sees careful not to wake babel as he went he repaired to the lodge where such little tokens of remembrance were sold and bought two wreaths one blue and white and glistening silver to my friend one of a soberer red and black and yellow to my friend with these he went back to the grave and so down on one knee again touching the child's lips with the brighter wreath he guided her hand to hang it on the cross then hung his own wreath there after all the wreaths were not far out of keeping with the little garden to my friend to my friend mr the englishman took it very ill when he looked round a street corner into the great place carrying babel in his arms that old mutuel should be there airing his red ribbon he took a world of pains to dodge the worthy mutuel and devoted a surprising amount of time and trouble to skulking into his own lodging like a man pursued by justice safely arrived there at last he made babel's toilette with as accurate a remembrance as he could bring to bear upon that work of the way in which he had often seen the poor corporal make it and having given her to eat and drink laid her down on his own bed then he slipped out into the barber's shop, and after a brief interview with the barber's wife and a brief recourse to his purse and card-case, came back again with the whole of Babel's personal property in such a very little bundle that it was quite lost under his arm. As it was irreconcilable with his whole course and character that he should carry Babel off in state or receive any compliments or congratulations on that feat, he devoted the next day to getting his two portmanteaus out of the house by artfulness and stealth and to comporting himself in every particular as if he were going to run away except indeed that he paid his few debts in the town and prepared a letter to leave for madame bouclet enclosing a sufficient sum of money in lieu of notice a railway train would come through at midnight and by that train he would take away babel to look for theophile in england and at his forgiven daughters at midnight on a moonlit night mr the englishman came creeping forth like a harmless assassin with babel on his breast instead of a dagger quiet the great place and quiet the never stirring streets close the cafes huddled together, motionless their billiard-balls, drowsy the guard or sentinel on duty here and there, lulled for the time by sleep, even the insatiate appetite of the office of town dues. Mr. the Englishman left the place behind, and left the streets behind, and left the civilian-inhabited town behind, and descended down among the military works of Vauban, hemming all in as the shadow of the first heavy arch and postern fell upon him and was left behind as the shadow of the second heavy arch and postern fell upon him and was left behind as his hollow tramp over the first drawbridge was succeeded by a gentler sound as his hollow tramp over the second drawbridge was succeeded by a gentler sound as he overcame the stagnant ditches one by one and passed out where the flowing waters were and where the moonlight so the dark shades and the hollow sounds and the unwholesomely locked currents of his soul were vanquished and set free see to it vauban of your own hearts who gird them in with triple walls and ditches and with bolt and chain and bar and lifted bridge raise those fortifications and lay them level with the all-absorbing dust before the night cometh when no hand can work 
All went prosperously, and he got into an empty carriage in the train, where he could lay Bebelle on the seat over against him as on a couch, and cover her from head to foot with his mantle. He had just drawn himself up from perfecting this arrangement, and had just leaned back in his own seat, contemplating it with great satisfaction, when he became aware of a curious appearance at the open carriage window, a ghostly little tin box floating up in the moonlight and hovering there. He leaned forward and put out his head. Down among the rails and wheels and ashes, Monsieur Mutuel, red ribbon and all. "'Excuse me, monsieur the Englishman,' said Monsieur Mutuel, holding up his box at arm's length, the carriage being so high and he so low. "'But I should reverence the little box forever, if your so generous hand will take a pinch from it in parting.' Mr. the Englishman reached out of the window before complying, and, without asking the old fellow what business it was of his, shook hands and said, "'Adieu! God bless you!' and mr the englishman god bless you cried madame bouclet who was also there among the rails and wheels and ashes and god will bless you on the happiness of the protected child now with you and god will bless you in your own child at home and god will bless you in your own remembrances and this from me he had barely time to catch a bouquet from her hand when the train was flying through the night Round the paper that enfolded it was bravely written, doubtless by the nephew who held the pen of an angel, homage to the friend of the friendless. "'Not bad people, Bebelle,' said Mr. the Englishman softly, drawing the mantle a little from her sleeping face, that he might kiss it, though they are so—' Too sentimental, himself, at the moment to be able to get out that word, he added nothing but a sob, and travelled for some miles, through the moonlight, with his hand before his eyes. End of Story 15 Part 2「Christmas Stories」by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 15. Somebody's Luggage. Part 3. Chapter 3. His Brown Paper Parcel. My works are well known. I am a young man in the art line. You have seen my works many a time, though it's fifty thousand to one if you have seen me. You say you don't want to see me. You say your interest is in my works and not in me. Don't be too sure about that. Stop a bit. Let us have it down in black and white at the first go-off, so that there may be no unpleasantness or wrangling afterwards. And this is looked over by a friend of mine, a ticket writer that is up to literature. I am a young man in the art line, in the fine art line. You have seen my works over and over again, and you have been curious about me, and you think you have seen me. Now, as a safe rule, you never have seen me, and you never do see me, and you never will see me. I think that's plainly put, and it's what knocks me over. If there's a blighted public character going, I am the party." It has been remarked by a certain, or an uncertain, philosopher, that the world knows nothing of its greatest men. He might have put it plainer if he had thrown his eye in my direction. He might have put it that while the world knows something of them that apparently go in and win, it knows nothing of them that really go in and don't win. There it is again in another form, and that's what knocks me over. Not that it's only myself that suffers from injustice, but that I am more alive to my own injuries than to any other man's, being, as I have mentioned, in the fine art line, and not the philanthropic line, I openly admit it. As to company and injury, I have company enough. Who are you, passing every day at your competitive excruciations? the fortunate candidates whose heads and livers you have turned upside down for life. 
not you you are really passing the crammers and coaches if your principle is right why don't you turn out to-morrow morning with the keys of your cities on velvet cushions your musicians playing and your flags flying and read addresses to the crammers and coaches on your bended knees beseeching them to come out and govern you then again as to your public business of all sorts your financial statements and your budgets the public knows much truly about the real doers of all that your nobles and right honourables are first-rate men yes and so is a goose a first-rate bird but i'll tell you this about the goose you'll find his natural flavour disappointing without stuffing perhaps i am soured by not being popular but suppose i am popular suppose my works never fail to attract suppose that whether they are exhibited by natural light or by artificial they inevitably draw the public then no doubt they are preserved in some collection no they are not they are not preserved in any collection copyright no nor yet copyright anyhow they must be somewhere wrong again for they are often nowhere says you at all events you are in a moody state of mind my friend my answer is i have described myself as a public character with a blight upon him which fully accounts for the curdling of the milk in that coconut those that are acquainted with london are aware of a locality on the surrey side of the river thames called the obelisk or more generally the obstacle those that are not acquainted with london will also be aware of it now that i have named it my lodging is not far from that locality i am a young man of that easy disposition that i lie abed till it's absolutely necessary to get up and earn something and then i lie abed again till i have spent it it was on an occasion when i had had to turn to with a view to victuals that i found myself walking along the waterloo road one evening after dark accompanied by an acquaintance and fellow lodger in the gas-fitting way of life he is very good company having worked at the theatres and indeed he has a theatrical turn himself and wishes to be brought out in the character of otello but whether on account of his regular work always blacking his face and hands more or less i cannot say tom he says what a mystery hangs over you yes mr click the rest of the house generally give him his name as being first front carpeted all over his own furniture and if not mahogany an out and out imitation yes mr click a mystery does hang over me makes you low you see don't it says he eyeing me sideways why yes mr click there are circumstances connected with it that have i yielded to a sigh a lowering effect gives you a touch of the misanthrope too don't it says he well i'll tell you what if i was you i'd shake it off if i was you i would mr click but if you was me you wouldn't ah says he there's something in that when we had walked a little further he took it up again by touching me on the chest you see tom it seems to me as if in the words of the poet who wrote the domestic drama of the stranger you had a silent sorrow there i have mr click i hope tom lowering his voice in a friendly way it isn't coining or smashing no mr click don't be uneasy nor yet forge mr click checked himself and added uh, counterfeiting anything for instance no mr click i am lawful in the art line fine art line but i can say no more ah under a species of star a kind of malignant spell a sort of a gloomy destiny a canker-worm pegging away at your vitals in secret as well as i make it out said mr click eyeing me with some admiration i told mr click that was about it if we came to particulars and i thought he appeared rather proud of me our conversation had brought us to a crowd of people the greater part struggling for a front place from which to see something on the pavement which proved to be various designs executed in coloured chalks on the pavement stones lighted by two candles stuck in mud sconces 
the subjects consisted of a fine fresh salmon's head and shoulders supposed to have been recently sent home from the fishmongers a moonlit night at sea in a circle dead game scroll-work the head of a hoary hermit engaged in devout contemplation the head of a pointer smoking a pipe and a cherubim his flesh creased as in infancy going on a horizontal errand against the wind all these subjects appeared to me to be exquisitely done on his knees on one side of this gallery a shabby person of modest appearance who shivered dreadfully though it wasn't at all cold was engaged in blowing the chalk dust off the moon toning the outline of the back of the hermit's head with a bit of leather and fattening the downstroke of a letter or two in the writing i have forgotten to mention that writing formed a part of the composition and that it also as it appeared to me was exquisitely done it ran as follows in fine round characters an honest man is the noblest work of god one two three four five six seven eight nine zero pounds shillings pence employment in an office is humbly requested honour the queen hunger is a zero nine eight seven six five four three two one sharp thorn chip chop cherry chop fall de roll de redo astronomy and mathematics i do this to support my family murmurs of admiration at the exceeding beauty of this performance went about among the crowd the artist having finished his touching and having spoilt those places took his seat on the pavement with his knees crouched up very nigh his chin and halfpence began to rattle in a pity to see a man of that talent brought so low ain't it said one of the crowd to me what he might have done in the coach painting or house decorating said another man who took up the first speaker because i did not why he writes alone like the lord chancellor said another man better said another i know his writing he couldn't support his family this way then a woman noticed the natural fluffiness of the hermit's hair and another woman her friend mentioned of the salmon gills that you could almost see him gasp then an elderly country gentleman stepped forward and asked the modest man how he executed his work and the modest man took some scraps of brown paper with colors in em out of his pockets and showed them then a fair-complexioned donkey with sandy hair and spectacles asked if the hermit was a portrait to which the modest man casting a sorrowful glance upon it replied that it was to a certain extent a recollection of his father this caused a boy to yelp out is the painter a smokin the pipe your mother who was immediately shoved out of view by a sympathetic carpenter with his basket of tools at his back. At every fresh question or remark the crowd leaned forward more eagerly and dropped the halfpence more freely, and the modest man gathered them up more meekly. At last another elderly gentleman came to the front and gave the artist his card to come to his office to-morrow and get some copying to do the card was accompanied by sixpence and the artist was profoundly grateful and before he put the card in his hat read it several times by the light of his candles to fix the address well in his mind in case he should lose it the crowd was deeply interested by this last incident and a man in the second row with a gruff voice growled to the artist you've got a chance in life now ain't you the artist answered sniffing in a very low-spirited way however i'm thankful to hope so upon which there was a general chorus of you are all right and the halfpence slackened very decidedly i felt myself pulled away by the arm and mr click and i stood alone in the corner of the next crossing why tom said mr click what a horrid expression of face you've got have i says i have you says mr click why you looked as if you would have his blood whose blood the artists the artists i repeated and i laughed frantically wildly gloomily incoherently disagreeably i am sensible that i did i know i did 
Mr. Click stared at me in a scared sort of way, but said nothing until we had walked a street's length. He then stopped short and said, with excitement on the part of his forefinger, "'Thomas, I find it necessary to be plain with you. I don't like the envious man. I have identified the canker-worm that's pegging away at your vitals, and it's envy, Thomas.' "'Is it?' says I. "'Yes, it is,' says he. "'Thomas, beware of envy. It is the green-eyed monster which never did and never will improve each shining hour, but quite the reverse. I dread the envious man, Thomas. I confess that I am afraid of the envious man when he is so envious as you are. Whilst you contemplated the works of a gifted rival, and whilst you heard that rival's praises, and especially whilst you met his humble glance as he put that card away, your countenance was so malevolent as to be terrific. Thomas, I have heard of the envy of them that follows the fine art line, but I never believed it could be what yours is. I wish you well, but I take my leave of you, and if you should ever get into trouble through knifing, or, say, garroting, a brother artist, as I believe you will, don't call me to character, Thomas, or I shall be forced to injure your case. Mr. Click parted from me with those words, and we broke off our acquaintance. I became enamoured. Her name was Henrietta. Contending with my easy disposition, I frequently got up to go after her. She also dwelt in the neighbourhood of the obstacle, and I did fondly hope that no other would interpose in the way of our union. To say that Henrietta was volatile is but to say that she was woman. To say that she was in the bonnet trimming is feebly to express the taste which reigned predominant in her own. She consented to walk with me. Let me do her the justice to say that she did so upon trial. I am not, said Henrietta, as yet prepared to regard you, Thomas, in any other light than as a friend. But as a friend I am willing to walk with you, on the understanding that softer sentiments may flow. We walked. Under the influence of Henrietta's beguilements I now got out of bed daily. I pursued my calling with an industry before unknown, and it cannot fail to have been observed at that period, by those most familiar with the streets of London, that there was a larger supply. But hold, the time is not yet come. One evening in October I was walking with Henrietta, enjoying the cool breezes wafted over Vauxhall Bridge. After several slow turns, Henrietta gaped frequently so inseparable from woman is the love of excitement, and said, Let's go home by Grosvenor Place, Piccadilly, and Waterloo. Localities, I may state for the information of the stranger and the foreigner, well known in London, and the last a bridge. No, not by Piccadilly, Henrietta, said I. And why not Piccadilly, for goodness sake, said Henrietta. Could I tell her? Could I confess to the gloomy presentiment that overshadowed me? Could I make myself intelligible to her? No. I don't like Piccadilly, Henrietta. But I do, said she. It's dark now, and the long rows of lamps in Piccadilly after dark are beautiful. I will go to Piccadilly. Of course we went. It was a pleasant night, and there were numbers of people in the streets. It was a brisk night, but not too cold and not damp. Let me darkly observe, it was the best of all nights, for the purpose. As we passed the garden wall of the royal palace, going up Grosvenor Place, Henrietta murmured, I wish I was a queen. Why so, Henrietta? It would make you something, said she, and crossed her two hands on my arm and turned away her head. Judging from this that the softer sentiments alluded to above had begun to flow, I adapted my conduct to that belief. Thus, happily, we passed on into the detested thoroughfare of Piccadilly. On the right of that thoroughfare is a row of trees, the railing of the green park, and a fine, broad, eligible piece of pavement. "'Oh, my!' cried Henrietta presently. "'There's been an accident.' I looked to the left and said, "'Where, Henrietta?' "'Not there, stupid,' said she, "'over by the park railings, where the crowd is. "'Oh, no, it's not an accident. "'It's something else to look at. "'What's them lights?' 
she referred to two lights twinkling low amongst the legs of the assemblage two candles on the pavement oh do come along cried henrietta skipping across the road with me i hung back but in vain do let's look again designs upon the pavement centre compartment mount vesuvius going it in a circle supported by four oval compartments several representing a ship in heavy weather a shoulder of mutton attended by two cucumbers a golden harvest with distant cottage of proprietor and a knife and fork after nature above the centre compartment a bunch of grapes and over the whole a rainbow the whole as it appeared to me exquisitely done the person in attendance on these works of art was in all respects shabbiness excepted unlike the former personage his whole appearance and manner denoted briskness though threadbare he expressed to the crowd that poverty had not subdued his spirit or tinged with any sense of shame this honest effort to turn his talents to some account the writing which formed a part of his composition was conceived in a similarly cheerful tone it breathed the following sentiments the writer is poor but not despondent to a british one two three four five six seven eight nine zero public he pounds shillings pence appeals honour to our brave army and also zero nine eight seven six five four three two one to our gallant navy britons strike the a b c d e f g writer in common chalks would be grateful for any suitable employment home hurrah the whole of this writing appeared to me to be exquisitely done but this man in one respect like the last though seemingly hard at it with a great show of brown paper and rubbers was only really fattening the downstroke of a letter here and there or blowing the loose chalk off the rainbow or toning the outside edge of the shoulder of mutton though he did this with the greatest confidence he did it as it struck me in so ignorant a manner and so spoilt everything he touched that when he began upon the purple smoke from the chimney of the distant cottage of the proprietor of the golden harvest which smoke was beautifully soft i found myself saying aloud without considering of it let that alone will you hello said the man next me in the crowd jerking me roughly from him with his elbow why didn't you send a telegram if we had known you was coming we'd have provided something better for you you understand the man's work better than he does himself don't you have you made your will you're too clever to live long don't be hard upon the gentleman sir said the person in attendance on the works of art with a twinkle in his eye as he looked at me he may chance to be an artist himself if so sir he will have a fellow feeling with me sir when i he adapted his action to his words as he went on and gave a smart slap of his hands between each touch working himself all the time about and about the composition when i lighten the bloom of my grapes shade off the orange in my rainbow dot the eye of my britons throw a yellow light into my cowcumber insinuate another morsel of fat into my shoulder of mutton dart another zigzag flash of lightning at my ship in distress he seemed to do this so neatly and was so nimble about it that the halfpence came flying in thanks generous public thanks said the professor you will stimulate me to further exertions my name will be found in the list of british painters yet i shall do better than this with encouragement i shall indeed you never can do better than that bunch of grapes said henrietta oh thomas them grapes not better than that lady i hope for the time when i shall paint anything but your own bright eyes and lips equal to life thomas did you ever but it must take a long time sir said henrietta blushing to paint equal to that i was prenticed to it miss said the young man smartly touching up the composition prenticed to it in the caves of spain and portugal ever so long and two year over there was a laugh from the crowd and a new man who had worked himself in next me said he's a smart chap too ain't he and what a eye exclaimed henrietta softly 
"'Ah, he need have an eye,' said the man. "'Ah, he just need,' was murmured among the crowd. "'He couldn't come that here burning mountain without a eye,' said the man. He had got himself accepted as an authority somehow, and everybody looked at his finger as it pointed out Vesuvius. To come that effect in a general illumination would require an eye, but to come it with two dips, why, it's enough to blind him. That impostor, pretending not to have heard what was said, now winked to any extent with both eyes at once, as if the strain upon his sight was too much, and threw back his long hair, it was very long, as if to cool his fevered brow. I was watching him doing it when Henrietta suddenly whispered, "'Oh, Thomas, how horrid you look!' and pulled me out by the arm. Remembering Mr. Click's words, I was confused when I retorted, "'What do you mean by horrid?' oh gracious why you looked said henrietta as if you would have his blood i was going to answer so i would for two pence from his nose when i checked myself and remained silent we returned home in silence every step of the way the softer sentiments that had flowed ebbed twenty mile an hour Adapting my conduct to the ebbings as I had done to the flowing, I let my arm drop limp, so as she could scarcely keep hold of it, and I wished her such a cold good night at parting, that I keep within the bounds of truth when I characterize it as a rasper. In the course of the next day I received the following document. Henrietta informs Thomas that my eyes are open to you. I must ever wish you well, but walking and us is separated by an unfarmable abyss. One so malignant to superiority, oh, that look at him, can never, never conduct Henrietta. P.S. To the altar. Yielding to the easiness of my disposition, I went to bed for a week after receiving this letter during the whole of such time london was bereft of the usual fruits of my labour when i resumed it i found that henrietta was married to the artist of piccadilly did i say to the artist what fell words were those expressive of what a galling hollowness of what a bitter mockery i i i am the artist i was the real artist of piccadilly i was the real artist of the waterloo road I am the only artist of all those pavement subjects which daily and nightly arouse your admiration. I do em, and I let em out. The man you behold with the papers of chalks and the rubbers touching up the downstrokes of the writing and shading off the salmon, the man you give the credit to, the man you give the money to, hires, yes, and I live to tell it, hires those works of art of me and brings nothing to em but the candles such is genius in a commercial country i am not up to the shivering i am not up to the liveliness i am not up to the wanting employment in an office move i am only up to originating and executing the work in consequence of which you never see me you think you see me when you see somebody else and that somebody else is a mere commercial character the one seen by self and mr click in the waterloo road can only write a single word and that i taught him and its multiplication which you may see him execute upside down because he can't do it the natural way the one seen by self and henrietta by the green park railings can just smear into existence the two ends of a rainbow with his cuff and a rubber if very hard put upon making a show but he could no more come the arch of the rainbow to save his life than he could come the moonlight fish volcano shipwreck mutton hermit or any of my most celebrated effects to conclude as i began if there's a blighted public character going, I am the party. And often as you have seen, 
do see and will see my works it's fifty thousand to one if you'll ever see me unless when the candles are burnt down and the commercial character is gone you should happen to notice a neglected young man perseveringly rubbing out the last traces of the pictures so that nobody can renew the same that's me chapter four his wonderful end it will have been ere now perceived that i sold the foregoing writings from the fact of their being printed in these pages the inference will ere now have been drawn by the reader may i add the gentle reader that i sold them to one who never yet author's note the remainder of this complimentary sentence editorially struck out end note having parted with the writings on most satisfactory terms for in opening negotiations with the present journal was i not placing myself in the hands of one of whom it may be said in the words of another author's note the remainder of this complimentary sentence editorially struck out end note i resumed my usual functions but i too soon discovered that peace of mind had fled from a brow which up to that time time had merely took the hair off leaving an unruffled expanse within it were superfluous to veil it the brow to which i allude is my own yes over that brow uneasiness gathered like the sable wing of the fabled bird as as no doubt will be easily identified by all right-minded individuals if not i am unable on the spur of the moment to enter into particulars of him the reflection that the writings must now inevitably get into print and that he might yet live and meet with them sat like the hag of night upon my jaded form the elasticity of my spirits departed fruitless was the bottle whether wine or medicine i had recourse to both and the effect of both upon my system was witheringly lowering in this state of depression into which i subsided when i first began to revolve what could i ever say if he the unknown was to appear in the coffee-room and demand reparation i one forenoon in this last november received a turn that appeared to be given me by the finger of fate and conscience hand in hand i was alone in the coffee-room and had just poked the fire into a blaze and was standing with my back to it trying whether heat would penetrate with soothing influence to the voice within when a young man in a cap of an intelligent countenance though requiring his hair cut stood before me mr christopher the head waiter the same the young man shook his hair out of his visions which it impeded took a packet from his breast and handing it over to me said with his eye or did i dream fixed with a lambent meaning on me the proofs although i had smelt my coat-tails singeing at the fire i had not the power to withdraw them the young man put the packet in my faltering grasp and repeated let me do him the justice to add with civility the proofs a y r with those words he departed a y r and you remember was that his meaning at your risk were the letters short for that reminder anticipate your retribution did they stand for that warning outdacious youth repent but no for that a o was happily wanting and the vowel here was a a i opened the packet and found that its contents were the foregoing writings printed just as the reader may i add the discerning reader peruses them in vain was the reassuring whisper a y r all the year round it could not cancel the proofs to appropriate name the proofs of my having sold the writings my wretchedness daily increased i had not thought of the risk i ran and the defying publicity i put my head into until all was done and all was in print give up the money to be off the bargain and prevent the publication i could not 
My family was down in the world, Christmas was coming on, a brother in the hospital, and a sister in the rheumatics could not be entirely neglected. And it was not only inns in the family that had told on the resources of one unaided waitering. Outs were not wanting. A brother out of a situation, and another brother out of money to meet an acceptance, and another brother out of his mind, and another brother out at New York, not the same, though it might appear so, had really and truly brought me to a stand till I could turn myself round. I got worse and worse in my meditations, constantly reflecting the proofs, and reflecting that when Christmas drew nearer, and the proofs were published, there could be no safety from hour to hour, but that he might confront me in the coffee-room, and in the face of day and his country, demand his rights. The impressive and unlooked-for catastrophe towards which I dimly pointed the reader, shall I add, the highly intellectual reader, in my first remarks now rapidly approaches. It was November still, but the last echoes of the Guy Foxes had long ceased to reverberate. We was slack, several joints under our average mark, and wine, of course, proportionate. So slack had we become, at last, that beds numbers twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, and thirty-one, having took their six o'clock dinners and dozed over their respective pints, had drove away in their respective hansoms for their respective night mail trains, and left us empty. I had took the evening paper to number six table, which is warm and most to be preferred, and lost in the all-absorbing topics of the day, had dropped into a slumber. I was recalled to consciousness by the well-known intimation, Waiter, and replying, Sir, found a gentleman standing at number four table. The reader, shall I add the observant reader, will please to notice the locality of the gentleman at number four table he had one of the new-fangled uncollapsible bags in his hand which i am against for i don't see why you shouldn't collapse while you are about it as your father's collapsed before you and he said i want to dine waiter i shall sleep here to-night very good sir what will you take for dinner sir soup bit of codfish oyster sauce and the joint thank you sir I rang the chambermaid's bell, and Mrs. Pratchett marched in, according to custom, demurely carrying a lighted flat candle before her, as if she was one of a long public procession, all the other members of which was invisible. In the meanwhile the gentleman had gone up to the mantelpiece, right in front of the fire, and had laid his forehead against the mantelpiece, which it is a low one, and brought him into the attitude of leapfrog, and had heaved a tremendous sigh. His hair was long and lightish, and when he laid his forehead against the mantelpiece, his hair all fell in a dusty fluff together over his eyes and when he now turned round and lifted up his head again, it all fell in a dusty fluff together over his ears. This gave him a wild appearance similar to a blasted heath. Oh, the chambermaid! Ah! He was turning something in his mind. To be sure, yes, I won't go upstairs now, if you will take my bag. It will be enough for the present to know my number. Can you give me a twenty-four B? Oh, conscience, what a adder art thou! Mrs. Pratchett allotted him the room, and took his bag to it. He then went back before the fire, and fell a-biting his nails. Waiter, biting between the words, give me bite, pen, and paper, and in five minutes, bite, let me have, if you please, bite, a uh, bite, messenger. Unmindful of his waning soup, he wrote and sent off six notes before he touched his dinner. Three were City, three West End. The City letters were to Cornhill, Ludgate Hill, and Farringdon Street. The West End letters were to Great Marlborough Street, New Burlington Street, and Piccadilly. Everybody was systematically denied at every one of the six places, and there was not a vestige of any answer. Our light porter whispered to me, when he came back with that report, "'All booksellers!' 
but before then he had cleared off his dinner and his bottle of wine he now mark the concurrence with the document formerly given in full knocked a plate of biscuits off the table with his agitated elbow but without breakage and demanded boiling brandy and water now fully convinced that it was himself i perspired with the utmost freedom when he became flushed with the heated stimulant referred to he again demanded pen and paper and passed the succeeding two hours in producing a manuscript which he put in the fire when completed he then went up to bed, attended by Mrs. Pratchett. Mrs. Pratchett, who was aware of my emotions, told me on coming down that she had noticed his eyes rolling into every corner of the passages and staircase, as if in search of his luggage, and that, looking back as she shut the door of 24B, she perceived him, with his coat already thrown off, immersing himself bodily under the bedstead, like a chimney-sweep before the application of machinery. The next day—I forbear the horrors of that night— was a very foggy day in our part of London, insomuch that it was necessary to light the coffee-room gas we was still alone and no feverish words of mine can do justice to the fitfulness of his appearance as he sat at number four table increased by there being something wrong with the meter having again ordered his dinner he went out and was out for the best part of two hours inquiring on his return whether any of the answers had arrived and receiving an unqualified negative his instant call was for melagatani, the cayenne pepper, and orange brandy. Feeling that the mortal struggle was now at hand, I also felt that I must be equal to him, and with that view resolved that whatever he took I would take. Behind my partition, but keeping my eye on him over the curtain, I therefore operated on melagatani, cayenne pepper, and orange brandy and at a later period of the day when he again said orange brandy i said so too in a lower tone to george my second lieutenant my first was absent on leave who acts between me and the bar throughout that awful day he walked about the coffee-room continually often he came close up to my partition and then his eyes rolled within too evidently in search of any signs of his luggage half-past six came and i laid his cloth he ordered a bottle of old brown i likewise ordered a bottle of old brown he drank his i drank mine as nearly as my duties would permit glass for glass against his he topped with coffee and a small glass i topped with coffee and a small glass he dozed i dozed at last waiter and he ordered his bill the moment was now at hand when we two must be locked in the deadly grapple swift as the arrow from the bow i had formed my resolution in other words i had hammered it out between nine and nine it was that i would be the first to open up the subject with a full acknowledgment and would offer any gradual settlement within my power he paid his bill, doing what was right by attendance, with his eyes rolling about him to the last for any tokens of his luggage. One only time our gaze then met, with the lustrous fixedness, I believe I am correct in imputing that character to it, of the well-known basilisk. The decisive moment had arrived. With a tolerable steady hand, though with humility, I laid the proofs before him gracious heavens he cries out leaping up and catching hold of his hair what's this print sir i replied in a calming voice and bending forward i humbly acknowledge to being the unfortunate cause of it but i hope sir that when you have heard the circumstances explained and the innocence of my intentions to my amazement i was stopped short by his catching me in both his arms and pressing me to his breastbone where I must confess to my face, and particularly nose, having undergone some temporary vexation from his wearing his coat buttoned high up, and his buttons being uncommon hard. Ha, 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 he cries, releasing me with a wild laugh, and grasping my hand. 
"'What is your name, my benefactor?' "'My name, sir?' I was crumpled and puzzled to make him out. "'Is Christopher. And I hope, sir, that, as such, when you've heard my ex in print,' he exclaimed again, dashing the proofs over and over, as if he was bathing in them. "'In print! Oh, Christopher! Philanthropist! Nothing can recompense you, but what sum of money would be acceptable to you?' I had drawn a step back from him, or I should have suffered from his buttons again. "'Sir, I assure you, I have been already well paid, and—no, no, Christopher, don't talk like that. What sum of money would be acceptable to you, Christopher? Would you find twenty pounds acceptable, Christopher?' However great my surprise, I naturally found words to say, "'Sir, I am not aware that the man was ever yet born without more than the average amount of water on the brain as would not find twenty pounds acceptable. But extremely obliged to you, sir, I'm sure,' for he had tumbled it out of his purse and crammed it in my hand in two banknotes. "'But I could wish to know, sir, if not intruding, how I have merited this liberality.' know then my christopher he says that from boyhood's hour i have unremittingly and unavailingly endeavoured to get into print know christopher that all the booksellers alive and several dead have refused to put me into print know christopher that i have written unprinted reams but they shall be read to you my friend and brother you sometimes have a holiday seeing the great danger i was in i had the presence of mind to answer never to make it more final i added never not from the cradle to the grave well says he thinking no more about that and chuckling at his proofs again but i am in print the first flight of ambition emanating from my father's lowly cot is realized at length the golden bough he was getting on, struck by the magic hand, has emitted a complete and perfect sound. When did this happen, my Christopher? Which happened, sir? This, he held it out at arm's length to admire it, this per rent. When I had given him my detailed account of it, he grasped me by the hand and said, Dear Christopher, it should be gratifying to you to know that you are an instrument in the hands of destiny, because you are. A passing something of a melancholy cast put it into my head to shake it and to say, Perhaps we all are. I don't mean that, he answered. I don't take that wide range. I confine myself to the special case. Observe me well, my Christopher hopeless of getting rid through any effort of my own of any of the manuscripts among my luggage all of which send them where i would were always coming back to me it is now some seven years since i left that luggage here on the desperate chance either that the too too faithful manuscript would come back to me no more or that some one less accursed than i might give them to the world you follow me my christopher pretty well sir i followed him so far as to judge that he had a weak head and that the orange the boiling and old brown combined was beginning to tell the old brown being heady is best adapted to seasonal cases years elapsed and those compositions slumbered in dust at length destiny choosing her agent from all mankind sent you here christopher and lo the casket was burst asunder and the giant was free he made hay of his hair after he said this and he stood a tiptoe but he reminded himself in a state of excitement we must sit up all night my christopher i must correct these proofs for the press fill all the inkstands and bring me several new pens he smeared himself and he smeared the proofs the night through to that degree that when saul gave him warning to depart in a four-wheeler few could have said which was them and which was him and which was blots his last instruction was that i should instantly run and take his corrections to the office of the present journal i did so 
They most likely will not appear in print, for I noticed a message being brought round from Beaufort Printing House, while I was a throwing this concluding statement on paper, that the old resources of that establishment was unable to make out what they meant upon which a certain gentleman in company as i will not more particularly name but of whom it will be sufficient to remark standing on the broad basis of a wave-girt isle that whether we regard him in the light of author's note the remainder of this complimentary parenthesis editorially struck out end note laughed and put the corrections in the fire editor's note Mr. Dickens partly contributed to another of the chapters, entitled His Umbrella, but for this the reader is referred to the number as republished in a collected volume, The Nine Christmas Numbers of All the Year Round. End, note. End of Story 15, Part 3